My goodness at the notes. They're everywhere. I didn't think they would start without me, though. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church in Gwin, Alabama. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, as we're, we're very glad to have you with us. If you would, there's a card in the pew in front of you. If you would, take that out and fill it out and drop it in the offering plate as that goes by, and that'll be your offering with us this morning. A few really quick announcements. There's some... <laughs> Did somebody set me up? <laughs> There's some, there's some desserts for donations in the gym. If you would like to, to purchase one of those, please see anybody with the Women on Missions back there. Uh, I believe they'll be back there following the service. Are, are any of them in here? They may be back there now. I don't know. So you might want to check with them. Desserts for donations. But I think somebody set me up here, so they tried to make me mess up. Now, you don't have to try very hard to mess me up, by the way. Uh, children's committee, we will meet this afternoon, 3.30. So if you're on the children's committee, please, please, please be here at 3.30 this afternoon. We'll meet in the um, room, the dig room just above the gym there that overlooks the gym. So if you're on the children's committee, please be here at 3.30 this afternoon. Uh, Living Last Supper, Sunday, March the 13th at 6 p.m. will be the, the play and the musical. And then uh, immediately following that, there will be a reception uh, that will have soup, sandwiches, and desserts. So that will be in the gym or the uh, multi-ministries building out back. Also tonight, 5 p.m., Children's Choir, uh, they will start the VBS musical. Uh, so anybody that's interested in being in the VBS musical, please be here this afternoon at 5 for Children's Choir. Are there any other announcements? If not... Good deal. Ushers, would you please come forward? Again, so glad to have everybody with us this morning. If you would, just take a moment to pray silently where you're at, and then I'll pray for us. Father, we are so grateful for yet another opportunity that you've blessed us with to come together and to worship you. Father, for who you are. Father, while we were yet sinners, you loved us. You sent your son to die on the cross for us. And Lord, through him, we may have eternal life. Father, I pray that's the message that's sent out this morning. As disciples of Jesus Christ, Father, may we reach people for his name's sake. Lord, I pray for opportunities that you would open doors for us to go out into the community and the surrounding area and share the gospel of Jesus Christ like we've never shared it before with more passion, more desire, and more fire than we've ever had. Lord, this morning I pray that the Holy Spirit would guide this service Lord, may our hearts be open, our minds be open. Lord, may we focus on you this morning through worship and through the word. Lord, I pray now that you would bless this offering and that you would use it to further thy kingdom. Lord, I ask that you forgive us where we failed you. We'll be so careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise for everything that takes place. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. God's people say it.
We say thank you this morning to Marie Boone and Buddy Langley. I think they've been playing together a few years, right? Two or three, is that right? If y'all would like a CD, Marie and Buddy both have CDs that they've done, and they're just a wonderful worship, worship event every time you listen to what they've seen. Pardon? Yeah. Thank you. Right now, as we continue in our worship, we're going to be able to watch a video as a part of our Here Am I, Lord, Send Me beautiful section that we're leading this morning related to going and giving and telling the gospel here for home missions. You and me. We are travelers. We take one step and then another and then another. That's the choice we've made because that's what it means to follow. No one can follow and stand still. If there's no movement, there's no following. And if there's no following, there's no faith. Faith is not a destination. It's a journey. That's why you and me, we are travelers. All of us on the same path and yet no two of us alike. Following costs everyone something. A prayer. A decision. A gift. We are all asked to give something of value. Because the world doesn't have what we have. That's why we are here. For the ones who don't follow, whatever our next step is, it must be in their direction. A prayer, a decision, a gift, that's what following is. It's the next step, because you and me, we are all. Travelers. Amen. Thank you. Would you say with me this morning, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. One more time. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Growing up in Selma, Alabama, attending the Elkdale Baptist Church, I learned about the greatness of God. From the early days of singing in children's choirs to later in the youth department, going on mission trips and serving the Lord and in college, being able to be supported by minister and staff and Sunday school teachers, I learned about the greatness of God every Sunday. And at the end of the church, I think I've told you before, they had an inscription in the back of the church, and it always said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us go this morning into the house of the Lord. Let us enter his presence. Let us bring thanksgiving to his name. Let us lift up the Lord Jesus today because great is our God. Let us stand as we sing. The 
Lord, here am I, send me. Are we willing this morning to go and to be and to do the person that God wants us to be in the places that he wants us to lead? Listen and, and ask your heart this morning, Lord, am I willing? Am I willing? to thee willingly yielded I come show the path that I must walk compel me then to go and if I stray bring back the light of day for here am I send me I pray the light of day for here am I in me I pray Children are dismissed. That's good stuff. I tell you what, that is good stuff. We're so blessed to uh, have had the beautiful song this morning just prior to the message, uh, Hear My Sin Me, because that happens to be the, uh, this year's slogan for our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, that being said, 
Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at lunch. If you'd like to meet us in the multi-ministries building, we will be having uh, the emphasis for the week of prayer for North American missions. Not by accident were we able to have with us today uh, one of those missionaries. Uh, Brother Rick Lance has been the face of Alabama Baptist. This is in the 18th year, and uh, I've grown to uh, love but also respect him for what he has done for Alabama Baptist in all these intervening years. Uh, he's been very helpful to me as an individual. Always look forward to hearing his challenge from the Word of God. So, Dr. Rick Lance, if you would please come. He is the Executive Director of Alabama Baptist. Well, good morning. Oh, you're three quarters awake. It's not even the, the Sunday for time change yet. You can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Well, great. I feel like I'm almost in vacation Bible school. Good morning, boys and girls. <laughs> I bring you greetings from 3,250 churches across Alabama of all sizes and shapes. We, it takes all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. And you're a part of a big family of faith right here in Alabama Baptist life. We take the Great Commission seriously. Not only have we tried to learn it by heart, but we've tried to take it to heart in relationship to what we're trying to do in Great Commission ministries. We have one mission, the Great Commission, one program, the Cooperative Program. And I want to thank you for your sacrificial and generous giving through the Cooperative Program through all these years as you have been on mission with the Great Commission here. I also want to thank your pastor. He is, I've grown to appreciate him uh, through the years. I've, I've watched his ministry everywhere he's ever go gone and served. He has had an impact, and certainly he has done that already here. Before he came here, none of you will probably remember, but I preached one Sunday, I think right after your previous pastor before him had left, and uh, met with the chair of the committee and talk with them, and uh, guess what? Just because of our meeting, you got this pastor that came to you. No, at, at that point, you were searching, you were deliberating, you were praying, you were meditating, and God led you to the right man for the right moment to do the right ministry right here in this city, in this area. Now, I noticed that some of you are fanning this morning. Uh, it, it, it's becoming very, if you will, uncharacteristic, un uncharacteristically and unseasonably warm. It is on the outside. In Alabama, we don't know how to dress around here. That is, we don't know what season we're in unless we're in the middle of 4th of July or in the depth of winter, whatever winter, whenever it comes, it decides in and of itself when to come. But whether it's hot or cold, we want to be warm-hearted for the Lord Jesus Christ. So in light of that, I want us today to begin the study of God's Word and to think about what we've been called to do. I came here with one message on my heart and mind, and through the course of the singing of the songs you've had, and also, of course, upon the focus that you're in in North American missions, I want to invite your attention to another location and another way of what we're going to do in studying God's Word. I want you to turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 20, and put one finger there. We're going to leap over in the way the Bible is, is sequentially laid out for us. It's not going to be a lot of movement, but there will be a page turn or so. I want to begin by just simply telling you that in my life, in my experience, I've lived, as some of the people of maturity might say, I've lived life in terms of chapters. Of course, growing up, I was, I say of course, but I was advantaged by having a Christian home and knowing something about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I can take you to the tree right on Shaco's campus, Shaco Springs, where a layperson witnessed to me and shared with me the gospel of Christ. I can take you to the church where I walked down the aisle and made my profession of faith 
After Shaco, we had vacation Bible school, and during vacation Bible school, I felt myself under conviction to be able to come to know, acknowledge my sin, and place my faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I is as much conjured up boldness that I could have. I walked down the aisle of that church, and I will never forget, as I began walking, the aisle looked longer and longer until I thought I would never get there. I felt the relief and the burden of my sin, even as a young boy, and from that point on, I knew what it was, to some degree at least, to walk by faith and not by sight. That is, to have faith in Jesus and to press forward. Well, just an intervening few years later, I felt the tug of God's pull and claim upon my life to go into full-time Christian service. I began preaching at a very early age. At my first sermon was, took place when I was not yet 16 years of age. Oh, yes. And it was back then we had Youth Week. They turned the service over to the young people. The music went okay. And then when I got up to preach, this is what happened. For months now, knowing in advance that I was going to preach that Sunday, I planned four sermons. And I labored over those four sermons, and they were in four directions in the Bible. Two of them, I recall, being in the Old Testament. The other two being in the New Testament, and one of them was in Revelation. And I remember looking at that and trying to decide, and so, like I did this morning, I came forward with one of them in mind as to preach. I got up that morning to preach in that service and became so nervous and so apprehensive, so filled with a sense of stage fright and anxiety, which takes place so often, that I took all four of those sermons and put them together and preached a total of eight and a half minutes. I had more compliments on that sermon than I've had in any of my life, and all of it was because of the brevity of it. People were astounded that someone could say anything and call it a sermon, and it'd be eight and a half minutes. Well, a lot has happened since then, and many times over the years I've had people probably wish they had heard eight and a half minute sermons, and perhaps you'll feel the same way in a moment. God put His claim on my life and through the developmental process of growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I became a pastor of several churches, the most recent of which, even though it's distant memory now, was the First Baptist Church of Tuscaloosa, where I served for one Sunday to the next, 15 years, Sunday to Sunday. I mean, the almost exact date. It was a wonderful chapter in the life of my own ministry and in our family life, it, uh, we, we have an endearing thought of First Baptist Tuscaloosa. Being a pastor was what I felt would be my lifelong claim and ministry until, if you will, not the Macedonian, but the Alabama call came upon my life and to go into state missions. I never had seen myself outside the pastorate. But my role and responsibility is to be one of your state missionaries. And my role and responsibility in that sense is to relate to, if you will, all levels of Alabama Baptist life and also to the extent that I can, all levels of life in the Southern Baptist Convention. Therefore, I know uh, somewhat, some degree about international missions. And just like we have an international missions board and just like we have a North American mission board, we have a state board of missions, and that is where I and some others serve you alongside you, assisting churches and helping foster ministry through the life of those churches as state missionaries. Now, the reason I belabor that personal testimony with you this morning, which I had not planned to do, is a verse that I've claimed is my verse for the year. It's found in this text in John chapter 20. I want to begin reading at verse 19, and we'll conclude this brief portion in verse 21. Keep in mind, this is one of those post-resurrection experiences of our Lord Jesus Christ. Post-resurrection. It is one of those times when the disciples have huddled together, and the huddle is a good way to put it, they were there for fear of what might happen to them for fear of the Jews, and I might add the Roman soldiers who might be looking for them as well. 
And this, notice what happens. And the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled. Now keep in mind, most times from that point on, the doors for the disciples are never shut. But at this point, at this stage, because they were certainly trying to metabolize and understand what was going on in the life and their own lives and ministries, the doors were shut. And when you go and shut your doors at night and lock them, you do so because you're trying to keep some people out, and rightly so. You read about crime, you hear about crime, you read about mischief going on, and you have fear, and fear is normal. This was normal for them. They had shut the doors because of fear. They were assembled for fear of the Jews, and keep in mind the Jews at this particular time, were, uh, they were under the notion that the body of Jesus had been stolen. That was the way they would classify this and characterize this. This new motion picture, Risen, if you've not seen it, it's historical fiction placing a Roman soldier in the context of the post-resurrection. But it does do, a, I think, very fine justice overall to the message of Jesus Christ. And it gives you an idea of what it was like for the disciples to be huddled away to try to, behind closed doors, wonder what was going to come next. They did fear the Jews, but also the Roman government had some concerns as well. Now notice, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Well, again, how do you understand this? They saw him crucified. That was a fact. They had witnessed his resurrection. That was a fact. This had never happened before in the sense of Jesus going to death and rising. They never anticipated that, though Jesus warned them and prophesied this was going to happen, tried to prepare them the best he could. But they still, just like you and I would be, they are thinking in different terms. They're personalizing this, and they just cannot see the expansive nature, the missionary world global nature of the ministry of Jesus. So when Jesus comes and stands in the midst of them, wouldn't you imagine that everybody kind of cleared their throat as their eyes became big and they just were in awe and speechless at this moment and rightly so, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. Now, that may sound anticlimactical to you, the word peace in Hebrew and Aramaic is the word shalom. And it's a beautiful word. In fact, we in our early years of marriage had a pet, a dog. We named that dog shalom. We loved the way it sounded. It just comes across that way, shalom. And the idea is when you met someone in the ancient days in Hebrew and in some extent Aramaic, the language of Jesus, you would say shalom, that is peace or and it's the idea of being irenic, which is another way, the Greek word for, our English Greek word for peace. But this is more than how are you. This is more than how are you doing. For the first time in their lives, they understood what peace really meant. Peace was being in the presence of Jesus Christ and living with that sense of presence for the rest of their lives. Today, when you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you enter in not a comfort zone, but a peace zone in your life, and therefore, Jesus, who is the personification of peace, begins to live within you and gives you a sense of peace even in the midst of chaos. No one would doubt that we now live in a chaotic and confused world. We, we know that. We, we, I've never seen an election cycle like this one, and I'm not going to be political, but I've never seen one like this one. In fact, I've never seen the most uncivil nature that seems to be going on and the wild and the weirdest ideas that seem to be floating around and people actually captivated by them. I, I just cannot imagine some of this. And, and I'm sure 
we'll look back on this and we'll see some sense coming through it. But right now, to be honest with you, it looks chaotic and confusing to me. But we could talk about that not only in terms of politics, we can talk about it in terms of economics. It is a global economy and we're in chaos there and confusion there. We can talk about it in our social strata of society. We can talk about it in our personal lives. Some of us are going through some of the most difficult days we've ever experienced. We would never have imagined. Isn't it good to know that we can have the peace that passes all human comprehension? That's what he's talking about when he just says, My peace be with you. The idea there, not just now, but forevermore, my peace is going to be with you. If he had not said that, I don't, I don't know what the, the disciples were expecting, but to be able to say to them, Peace be with you, is a calming word for them. I, I, I think sometimes we just need to readopt that kind of phraseology. When we see someone who is having difficulty, may we say, the peace of God be with you. Not just to be flippant or nonchalant, but to be serious and focused in what we're saying. God's peace, may God's peace dwell in you so richly that your heart and life will be filled with His presence. Peace be with you. Now, here comes the part I really like. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands, his side, the nail-scarred hands. He showed them that. Show and tell. You remember that in school? school? Show and tell? I don't think he was real showy about it, but he showed them his hands. He showed them his side. He showed them the evidences of his crucifixion. Now, we, we move here from the element of peace to evidence. The idea is he's going to evidence the fact that he is who he says he was. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. He was going to resurrect from the grave. Up from the grave he arose. And then notice what happens. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I don't know what makes you happy. I don't know what really turns you on in, in terms of your own Christian life. Most of us who are grandparents, and I happened to join that silly club a few years ago, you know what it is about being a grandparent. Nowadays, people used to would walk around in their purses or billfolds and have pictures of their grandchildren. Now they have them on their, on their smartphones. And if you don't want to see an album of pictures, you better not ask, do you have any grandchildren? Because everyone's going to show... And the thing about it is it makes grandparents glad. I, I really think now as I'm seeing this, I, I really I realize some of that. It, it, it's you're able to relive childhood again and relive to some degree vicariously parenting. It makes you glad. When you see your children, when you, you see your grandchildren, and if you've been away from your, your spouse for a while, it's, you, there's a glad reunion when you... You come together. Makes you glad. Some people get become glad when they are able to experience, if they're aficionados of sports, their favorite team winning a, uh, their championship. I'll leave it at that. But no, nonetheless, people become glad when things happen. But listen, this is the most important moment up to this point in their lives. The disciples truly saw the Lord as the crucified, risen Lord and Savior. And it made them glad. The focus then comes in verse 21, which is my verse for the year. Then Jesus said to them, Peace to you. Let me remind you, peace. My presence brings peace in your life. You can look to the world for peace, but you'll not find it. In the world, you'll find tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, and I have come to give you peace, even in the midst of chaos and tribulation. Peace, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. Now there's the part that is my verse for the year. 
Let's think about that briefly, just for a moment. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. That's mind-boggling when you think about it. Uh, what happened in the sending of Jesus into this world? Well, we know that Jesus invaded this world not as a conquering king riding on a horse and behind him was a teeming mass of thousands of soldiers and he came as a, a conqueror that everyone undeniably would understand conquest. They would fall at his feet. No, he didn't come that way. He didn't come as a king who occupied a throne where everyone would come and be bowing before him as a subject. He didn't come as a grown man who might represent what we would talk about today as the men of Wall Street, the men of economy, the men of accomplishment. He didn't come as an adult. He came as a cooing baby. To identify with all of us, God became flesh and dwelt among us. That's how God sent him into the world. But now, if, if, if Jesus was just sent in the world exclusively, although that's the most important thing which happened, to die on the cross and resurrect it from the grave, he would have sent him as a 33-year-old man. No, he sent him as a, a young babe to identify with all of us. By the way, I think the last time I checked, every single one of us has been born. We, we all have that in common. And we know that flesh communicates with flesh. And spirit communicates with spirit. I like to think of it this way. We are human flesh seeking the identity of God, desiring His Spirit to live within us. God is Spirit who became flesh, not only to identify with us, but to live through us. So, in that sense, God sent Jesus into this world to outline for us what we're supposed to do. He is now sending us Quickly look at that familiar verse over in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and notice what he has sent us to do. This corresponds to the actual end of this, this chapter, chapter 20, of John's gospel. And here where Jesus is picking up now with these disciples, Luke is telling the story of these disciples now who have begun to comprehend the nature of what Jesus it has done in his life and ministry, and now what they're supposed to do in their lives and in their ministries. The outline for the rest of the book of Acts is right here, and very briefly, we're just going to look at it. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. He gives us the where. You'll be my witnesses, witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in, Judea, in Samaria, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I like to think of this as Jesus challenging us to witness with His power. Now, you can give witness. I can stand here and witness that I know you and met you and maybe know something about you, and that's a witness. We can go on a witness stand and be a witness about something that's happened, a murder or some kind of issue that's taken place which is of legal dynamics. We can witness an accident. We can witness the growth of a person over a period of time. We can witness special and current events. But he says, I want you to be my witness, and I want you to do it with my power. I like to think of our lives like a limp glove. Now, I could stand here if I had this limp glove before you, and I could stand here and I could say, oh, there's power in this glove. And you would look at me rather astonished and say, that is absolutely ridiculous. There's no power in that glove. It's just a limp glove. But when I put my hand in it, it has all the power of this limited hand has. Certainly more power than it had before. Not much power because there's not much strength in my hand. There's more strength perhaps in yours. But when you put your hand in that glove, that, that glove has been empowered with your power. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. You'll be my witnesses when you receive the Holy Spirit's power, and I'm going to live through you. You will be my witnesses, not the witnesses of Judaism, not the witnesses of the synagogue, 
not the witnesses of the temple, not the witnesses of your anti-Roman empire sentiments. You're going to be my witnesses. I am sending you as the Father has sent me, and you've witnessed my life. Now I'm going to send you to be my witnesses. And then work his plan. His plan is, his strategy has already been determined. You'll be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, we could just simply say, is your local area. This is your local area here. You're to be witnesses here. And Judea, we could call that your state of Alabama. Let's use that. And Samaria, let's call that North America. And the ends of the earth, obviously, would be international. The idea is we're called to all of those areas, not just to one, even though you and I live in a Jerusalem and a Judea, and we're certainly aware of what's going on in our Samaria, North America, with 335 million people in it, and the fourth largest mission field in the world is America. Now, hear that. The fourth largest unreached part of the world is North America. Would it surprise you to know that there are more professing believers in China than there are in North America? That's a reality, something that we eclipsed by communism and its regime over the years. But now, with a degree of openness, we're able to see that there are witnesses and there are people of faith who have been trumpeting the message of God, even though it's been a trumpet underground, so to speak. Samaria and the ends of the earth. I want to tell you about someone you may know something about. Maybe you haven't. In late December 2002, a very bad episode happened in terrorism. At Jibla Hospital, our own Martha Myers from Alabama, who grew up here in this state, trained, educated in this state, went to medical school in this state, became a doctor, and left here in 1977, and for 25 years, she poured her life into Yemen. And she was a, a Yemeni doctor, a doctor in Yemen, one of the few women. They don't have many women doctors, and you can imagine that women don't often go to male doctors. Now, think about that just a little bit. That's her ministry, and she's going even beyond just women, to anyone that she can serve, through Jibla Hospital, put a backpack on her back, and she walk up to villages and mountain areas, remote, well beyond any traffic of any kind of vehicle, and she served. M most of the women would call her Sister Martha. <clears throat> well, on this late December day, 2002, one of those patients, one of those women's husbands, entered Jibla Hospital with hatred in his heart, thinking she had been proselytizing and influencing his wife, and he went in there to kill every Christian he could. He got three out of the four missionaries we had there, and Martha Myers was one of them. <clears throat> you want to know where Martha's buried? Not in Montgomery, Alabama, where she grew up. Martha is buried on the hillside, right on the hillside above Jibla Hospital, as if to say, my heart is here. My life was given here. Her life was not taken. Her life was given. There was a time early in her life when she came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, and then something happened to her. She was sent you and I may not be sent to Yemen. We may not be sent to Africa. We may not even be sent to Boston. We might not be sent to Atlanta. But we are sent to, where, to be here, there, and everywhere with the gospel of Jesus Christ until He comes. That is a non-negotiable. He gave the Great Commission to every single follower of Jesus Christ, no matter how educated or uneducated, how cultured or uncultured, whether we're gifted or not so gifted, 
whether we're learned or not so learned, whether we're economically blessed or not so economically blessed, we, every single one of us, every single one of us, has been sent. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Stand with me, please. Father God, we pray this day that you will help us understand ever and always what it means to be sent by you, to represent you in a world needing to know, starved, gospel starved for the message of good news, of grace and faith in Christ. I pray, Father, that if there's someone here this morning who's never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, that this will be the time and the occasion when they would trust you as Lord and Savior acknowledging their sin, believing in you, committing their lives to you. I pray for those who might need to become a part of this fellowship and transfer membership, or those who might need to come on recommitment or rededication, whatever the need. Lord, this is your service. Move mightily even now as your people sing a hymn which speaks of our personal testimony of those of us who know you that would rather have you than to have the whole world. We thank you for the gift of life in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.
I've come this morning because I think it's time to let the church family know so that you can be praying for me very hard that several weeks ago in discipleship training class, Stan Junkin had a book, The Insanity of God. He asked that anyone who would like to read the book raise their hand. For some reason, my hand shot up. I don't volunteer to read books, and I'm not a very avid reader anyway. I read this book, and I didn't get very far into it until God started speaking to me. And I know that since 2010, I'm a child of God because I truly and honestly gave my heart to Jesus. Since that time, I haven't been a very good witness, but I read that book, and God spoke to me, and he said, Jane, I'm calling you into something special. It may just be here in your own town. It may be in the state. It may be in the country. But I want you to start being more on fire for me. I want you to go out and tell people how much Jesus loved you and give your testimony and tell them what Jesus can do for them. Since finishing that book, I've been able to witness to two different people. And I was talking to Zane one day this week after I'd shared my testimony, and um, I told him that, you know, I didn't have the finances to go any far, very far, anywhere. And he said, Jane, you know, with God, all things are possible. And I thought, Zane, you're so right. So I'm not, I don't feel a call to go to Africa. But I just would like for the church to pray for me that I'll be a better witness wherever I am. I told Zane, I said, you know, Zane, I don't see very many people that are not Christians. I stay here and work, and I greet church members. Sometimes a visitor come along, and I talk to them. But I said, uh, you know, I just, I go home, and it's with me. Sometimes it's the grandchildren or family mostly. So I would just like for you as a church to pray for me that, I will do what God wants me to do every day. But I'll just be stronger and I will just be bolder. I know why I raised my hand. God raised my hand that day because he knew that he was going to call me special. And I just thank y'all so much for your prayers and your love. If you would commit to praying for Jane, would you please say amen? amen. Destiny, if you would please come. Uh, Destiny Overton has come. She has made a profession of faith in Christ. We uh, uh, know she didn't have to kneel and pray this morning. She had already done that, taken care of that. And she's come this morning with a request that she be received as a uh, uh, candidate for baptism membership at First Baptist Church. If uh, you would agree with that, would you please say amen? amen. Kim, you going to come stand with her? Thank you. That being said, Dr. Lance, thank you so much. If you would come here, I know there's some that would like to speak to you. Uh, rather than benediction, I'm going to ask you to please come by and give to Destiny the right hand of Christian fellowship. And please, if you've enjoyed the message today, would you let uh, Dr. Lance know that as well. God be with you until we meet again.